Um, so this, uh, this work has been uh, quite a bit of hacking, so there's uh, quite a long author list that I, I won't read out. Um, but uh, it's been done uh, at the University of Cambridge and also with uh, Citrix Systems as well, uh, who are based in Cambridge. Now, the, the slide deck is, is self-hosting. It's actually written in the operating system that we're uh, talking about. So if anyone wants to follow along, um, you can go to dex.openmirage.org, and uh, the slide decks are all up there under the NSDI 2015 uh, bit. And this, uh, this one here is running on a local system here that is uh, actually running on Zen. So as we go through the talk, uh, if uh, one of them cuts out, I will switch over seamlessly to the, the, the one hosted in the cloud. So just to give you a bit of introduction into, as to uh, why we've been doing all this work in unikernels. And a lot of it comes down to the massive surge of IoT devices that are um, all quote unquote becoming smart. And we've seen this, uh, this, this set of beautifully designed devices, uh, weight scales, a tweet, uh, 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 home thermometers that keep an eye on you, and uh, set the temperature, and even little printers that you can text to. Now, all of these devices are, uh, contain pretty powerful processors and uh, operating systems that are uh, very conventional, uh, such as Linux and, uh, and embedded distributions. Now, the problem is a lot of these systems depend on, uh, on cloud connectivity to provide their uh, functionality. And as latency increases, as you go to remote cloud ser services for all of your compute, um, you, you get a real problem of observable latency becoming an issue. So if I try to use Siri to uh, ask for directions, it's going to have that awkward pause of uh, 500 milliseconds to a second while it uh, has multiple RTTs to the cloud, activates its microphones. And uh, when it's disconnected, of course, it doesn't work. So in our, in our ideal world, we want to be able to have clouds of ARM devices around our environments. And uh, we uh, interact directly with something locally and uh, upload computation to it and uh, not require uh, cloud services for all of our IoT computation. And this ability to move computation locally and upload it to ARM devices is one of the key drivers behind the Jitsi work. Unfortunately, at the same time, um, having another trillion devices running uh, uh, arbitrary code has just comp is compounding the security problem we're facing on the internet right now. We've seen just attack after attack that is hitting operating system distributions and just taking out and leaking our data. So it's clear that if we just continue down this path and uh, deploy even more services uh, built on this infrastructure, things are going to end pretty badly. And in particular, these IoT devices are often uh, stuff that uh, is uh, hazardous to our health if it goes wrong. Uh, with heartbeat and shell shock, to some extent, it's okay if a cloud service gets compromised, but if your pacemaker gets compromised, your industrial automation systems, um, and, and many, many other things that uh, uh, physically actuate our day-to-day -day lives, uh, things will, uh, things will um, not be good in the future for cybersecurity and our uh, general societal health. So we really want to, at the same time as pushing computation to the edge, make things fundamentally more robust uh, on the edge network. Now, there's a few challenges with making this happen. Um, Ideally, on the cloud, we use virtual machines in order to provide very, very strong isolation between services. And the issue is uh, virtual machines have never really taken off in embedded devices because they tend to be designed with um, an extreme emphasis on resource uh, uh, usage. And uh, they tend to exhibit very large uh, boot times and management overheads. You have to manage multiple operating systems on a tiny little microcontroller. And on the other hand, Linux containers and, 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 and similar technologies of Windows and FreeBSD and Solaris are really easy to use. Um, they tend to uh, share the same operating system, and uh, they uh, give you a wide interface where uh, you can virtualize parts of the operating system, uh, such as the namespace or the networking subsystem, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and boot up a, a, a different virtual container. The problem is they suffer from very poor isolation. So if you cram in two competing multi-tenant services, you're never going to get the same level of isolation that you get from a virtual machine that is providing hardware level protection between two instances. So the real question between our research is uh, whether or not we can eliminate this fundamental trade-off between latency and isolation. Can we get services that are hypervisor level isolated, um, but still providing very, very different services at low latency to the users? And meanwhile, in industry, uh, we're seeing some pretty shocking stuff. So industry is not deploying virtual machines at, 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 a, at a high rate. So this particular quote from Embedded Computing last week um, said that the infotainment system in a car is by nature open and internet connected. Uh, it's very nice and, and pretty. And uh, meanwhile, the mission critical driving instruments are, uh, can't be compromised. 
Uh, but just to save a few million dollars a year, the car manufacturers have just stuck them on the same embedded device and put them beside each other in the sa on the same uh, virtual LAN uh, within the car. And we've seen similar issues on uh, Boeings and other aircraft that have their uh, flight control software and their uh, nice uh, movie systems all put on the same infrastructure. So we really, really want to build this stuff so that we can avoid this future and actually have different virtual machines running your um, aircraft controller and your car braking systems from uh, the system running your, uh, your music player. And to do this, we're adopting something called unikernels. So instead of deploying large heavyweight operating systems onto embedded devices, uh, we're building specialized uh, virtual machine images that are compiled from the full stack of application code. And the idea behind these, these have been uh, presented before at several conferences, um, is that they're single system image virtual machines that only do one task. And they boot, they act as a web server or a DNS server or some other protocol server, and they're contained, they're compact, and they're efficient. So the intention is very much to simplify the deployment and management, uh, sacrifice dynamic configuration, and just have this specialized appliance just doing one thing and doing it um, as best as it can. Now, this is a, is a graph from, uh, from Asplos just showing that uh, when we first built unikernels in x86, they can boot very fast. So where Linux takes quite a bit of memory and um, a highly optimized instance can take uh, uh, over half a second to boot, uh, we can boot these things in 10 milliseconds in x86. So we have some interesting raw materials to work from when building um, our new system. So the contributions of uh, the work here um, are that we've taken all of this work in unikernels and we ported them to uh, ARM-based infrastructures that run um, all over uh, uh, our physical environments. So we ported unikernels to uh, Zen ARM7. So this is a new architecture in the Zen hypervisor, which is formerly only really supported x86. Um, and in addition to maintaining uh, the ARM port, we've also ensured that all of the unikernels built using our prototype are type safe all the way down to the device drivers. So we built the code up from the device drivers all the way up to the protocol stacks and ensured that uh, uh, down to the shared memory layer at Zen, that there's no um, uh, non bounce check memory. So we're trying to maintain that invariant through all of our benchmarks and evaluations. And then we constructed this Jitsu tool stack that is trying to figure out how do we, how do we take unikernels and just boot them on demand only when necessary. Because obviously we're running on uh, very resource constrained and embedded devices and we don't want to constantly run all the services we need. The intuition is that some services will just wake up on demand, uh, execute for a few seconds and go back to sleep again, um, all uh, cocooned within a virtual machine environment. Uh, and finally, uh, we just want to evaluate this against uh, existing uh, alternative systems such as Docker and just try to figure out exactly where we sit in the space of um, isolation technologies. Uh, one, one thing that I should point out is that this is being presented from this little device that will very gingerly hold up because there's some power that is looking a bit dodgy. And uh, it's, it's a two megabyte uh, unikernel. Uh, it's written in full OCaml and uh, it's something that anyone can download and try out as well. So you can just go to openmirage.org and, uh, and, and uh, if you have 40 bucks, you can just buy one of these boxes and uh, give it a try. So we've published all of the source code out there. You can just see the little board there um, if you can't see that uh, on your screen. So, the Jitsu tool stack. The idea behind Jitsu is that uh, it's a replacement Zen tool stack um, that still maintains compatibility with existing virtual machines. So you can still boot Linux and FreeBSD and so on, but it's highly tuned for booting up unikernels. And uh, to do this, we had to do several things. We had to break a number of assumptions caked into uh, the hypervisor tool stack that it's running in a big beefy data center, it's got gigabytes of RAM, uh, and it's only running a few virtual machines, for example, 10 virtual machines per host. Um, in, in the case of unikernels, you can, in theory, run tens of thousands because they're all uh, tiny with very little uh, resource uh, requirements, but uh, the, you still have the latency of those data center assumptions that are baked into, into Zen right now. So the first thing we did was to uh, do a number of performance improvements to Zen that I'll uh, describe. And we wanted to answer the question of whether virtual machines are fundamentally too slow to be used on these embedded devices or not. Um, but you know, if we can beat the state of the art with Linux and FreeBSD uh, and now Windows on ARM, then we're doing pretty well. And then once we have these, these things booted, we have to establish a distributed system within the ARM box that does not have the overhead of all of the existing virtualization solutions right now. So right now, you tend to have a bridging infrastructure on a, uh, on a host, you use loopback TCP, and you have all of the overheads associated with a full networking stack. So we wanted something that operates within shared memory timescales and not on um, uh, TCP timescales, uh, both for resource usage and for latency. And then finally, I'll describe how all of this is glued together um, into an on-demand uh, stack. So the basic architecture of Jitsu is um, in this ARM box. We have a few goals. The first one is that we have ARM hardware and it's running uh, the Zen hypervisor, but all traffic from the outside world must go through unikernels. None of it is ever exposed um, to something written uh, in a C networking stack. Uh, 
So this way, we can have a reasonable chance of running this stuff for um, a few years without uh, it being hit by buffer overflow attacks. And because it's, it's, uh, it's also written in a slightly higher level style, it's hopefully more immune to, um, to other higher level um, issues as well. There's details of all of the attacks we've looked at in the, uh, in the full paper. And these unikernels all communicate with the tool stack through a shared memory transport provided by Zen using a database known as Zen Store. And the Jitsu tool stack just sits there and it uh, uses the Linux kernel as normal in Zen to uh, mediate physical hardware. Uh, and it also uh, can spin up legacy virtual machines such as Linux, legacy is possibly an inflammatory word, uh, conventional virtual machines such as Linux and Windows uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, provide services that uh, you couldn't uh, get in a clean slate unikernel. So the Zen ARM tool stack was an interesting exercise. It actually required a lot of coding uh, and was more interesting than we expected. So we had to rebuild the entire operating system infrastructure uh, for a new ABI for Zen. So we built a new mini operating system called Minios. And um, this Minios, because we had the chance to build a clean slate, removed all of libc. So it doesn't really have any of the conventional POSIX layers. It only exists to run a high-level language runtime, such as OCaml, um, and uh, soon uh, support for uh, other languages. And the vast majority of other code remained in OCaml. So it's a very, very small system. For those familiar with Zen, uh, the x86 driver model is a, is a thing of nightmares. Uh, I think we have a total of six different ways to boot uh, x86 virtual machines now, HVM, PVH, PVHVM, which is different. And uh, all of these are because of the different hardware quirks present in x86. The ARM uh, model requires hardware ARM virtualization and is just a breath of fresh air. It doesn't have QMU um, uh, emulation and a lot of the other DOM0 uh, bits that made uh, uh, x86 so very complex. But at the same time, we have much less CPU available. So we're trying to figure out um, how we can optimize the tool stack on this new Minios uh, port to make sure that uh, we don't use up the precious cycles uh, in a normal ARM uh, box. So one of the first things we did was try to figure out when you boot virtual machines, one thing we observed in Zen was that um, the more machines you're booting in parallel, uh, the more asymptotically slow it gets. And the reason for this is that the coordination system within the, the tool stack was just not designed to boot at large numbers of uh, virtual machines. And so its notion of transactions involved just backing off immediately whenever it, uh, it ran into a long-running transaction. So uh, the details in the paper, but with the original Zen tool stack written in C, you can see that as you booted a more parallel virtual machines, uh, the amount of time it would take would just tremendously rise up to minutes in some occasions. And with a sequence of successive optimizations designed to prevent conflicts and backoffs in the, in the transaction store, we can now uh, get a pretty good rate of uh, parallel boots without causing any, any undue conflicts. So the first thing was to prevent the massive explosion of, um, of conflicts to prevent the boot time from ever going up to minutes, even if you're booting lots of uh, unikernels up. The next step was just uh, a very, very methodical process of getting rid of a number of uh, latency crimes in, in, a, in, a, in a hot data path. So whenever you look at the normal Zen boot times, so this uh, graph represents uh, the virtual machine uh, memory overheads uh, on the bottom that intrinsically increase the boot time, and then the amount of time it takes to boot and uh, transmit a network packet. So in this case, we have, um, for Linux, uh, unmodified, uh, a boot time of around uh, 700 milliseconds. And by d removing a sequence of shell scripts, uh, a whole bunch of uh, ping pongs, a bunch of serialized device attachments. For example, a virtual machine refuses to do any work until its console um, attaches. In the case of a unikernel, it can happily continue to uh, uh, do networking initialization in parallel with the console. Uh, we got it down to about uh, 150 milliseconds to, to boot. Now, this is an ARM. On x86, these optimizations resulted in close to instantaneous boot time. Um, because we have so much more CPU on x86, um, it got it all the way down to 10 milliseconds. So it's interesting that although all of this work was done on ARM, it just works out of the box in x86, and any uh, data centers that are uh, requiring this kind of fast boot and hyperfluidity uh, can take advantage of this. And in fact, uh, one of our uh, uh, colleagues from NEC has uh, just got a paper in Hot Cloud describing how they can take advantage of this kind of technique uh, in an x86 data center as well. So there's a lot of um, life in this kind of uh, latency emphasis uh, in the longer term. Uh, once that was done, we now have the ability to boot in, uh, in uh, just a few milliseconds, uh, uh, but it's still significant. And we wanted to make sure that we had a really good solid mechanism for inter unikernel communication. And here we turn to uh, our old friends from Plan 9, and what they have is a mechanism to uh, get uh, uh, a directory-style system that can establish peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer connections without involving any network sockets. It looks very, very similar to uh, the Plan 9 model in the sense that it provides a rendezvous facility for virtual machines to, uh, to publish 
uh, parts in a directory style namespace and uh, then coordinate and communicate and form shared memory channels. Uh, the details are in the paper, of course. It's worth just pointing out how tree-like this thing is. So we didn't invent a new tool stack for this. Uh, we used the existing ZenStore tool stack that um, already is used by virtual machines to communicate device driver information and simply extended it uh, with all of the information required to implement a Plan 9 style uh, like file system. And um, although I won't go into details over here, it's worth just noting how um, uh, elegant it is uh, compared to building yet another tool chain in order to um, interoperate. We can use all of the existing Zen tools to figure out uh, what the state of uh, shared memory communications are between unikernels. So once this is done, um, things get interesting because we now have the ability to boot unikernels and set up shared memory channels. And Jitsu is a directory service that launches a virtual machine at boot time and it handles name resolution, uh, whether it's uh, from a local, uh, local node um, or remote from, uh, from DNS. So you can actually start taking external network traffic and start activating unikernels on, on demand. And the goal of Jitsu is very simple. When something arrives, it will boot the unikernel and after a timeout, it will just kill the service. And if uh, the unikernel is not ready, it will also act as a proxy. Now, getting this race free was fairly non-trivial. The most obvious way for Jitsu to work is that you have a client that makes a DNS request, and the query goes into Jitsu, which then proceeds to uh, invoke the Zen domain builder and then boot the uh, unikernel. The obvious problem, though, is that the unikernel, even if it boots in 10 milliseconds, uh, can still um, uh, miss a sin because a client might be on the local LAN and acting in a matter of milliseconds. So in this case, the, the uh, client would send a sin, it would time out, and it would take a second to send another sin, and that's a very, very high latency that's observable. So what we did was we built Sinjitsu. And what Sinjitsu does is that it splits the unikernel in half and takes the TCP IP stack um, that is sufficient to act the packet, and it records and buffers it in ZenStore and waits for the um, networking subsystem and all of the other bits to boot up. This takes another few milliseconds uh, in the boot process. And once that's done and uh, the networking becomes active, the Sinjitsu will replay immediately to the unikernel, which at boot time will read from its conduit namespace, understand exactly what packets are waiting, and instantaneously just leap into action, take over the connections, and start serving the actual uh, protocol traffic, in this case, HTTP. So a lot of that was, uh, was quite effective because um, by the act of um, acting all this buffering, we managed to get the latency down to, uh, to a few hundred milliseconds. So on x86, the boot latency, as I observed, was 30 to 45, and we got it to around 350 to 400 milliseconds for a cold boot uh, on, um, on one of these ARM boxes. So it's still, there's still scope to get it down to the uh, low amount of numbers by doing more uh, low-level uh, Zen and particularly memory optimizations, but we're pretty happy that we can actually boot a service uh, in a virtual machine at this uh, low latency. So it's interesting observing this, this graph here from the paper just shows how um, different clumps of latency happen for different modes of Jitsu. So on the right here, we have, uh, Sinjits, uh, we have a mode without any um, optimizations or buffering, and then as we add more of the optimizations we described, uh, we start getting down for all of our requests into the, uh, the nice reliable 300 millisecond range. Docker um, was uh, by default uh, a, a second or more. And the reason for this is that when you boot Linux containers, it forces you to touch the disk because you have to set up your AFS file system or your BitRFS um, uh, layer in file system, and that just takes a lot of time. In, it, uh, in contrast, unikernels just boot without a block device, and they can parallelize um, all of their operations in order to make sure that they go as uh, quickly as possible. So I'm just going to hand over to my colleague Magnus, who will uh, take you through a little bit more flavor on, on how this works. Thank you. OK, uh, I'm going to show you uh, a s short demonstration of how it works with, oh, let's see if we can, uh, with Jitsu and unikernels running on a QB board. Here we have uh, three SSH sessions uh, to an ARM board, a QB board, and in the lower uh, session, we're going to see the VMs that are currently running. Uh, right now, we only have the host operating system, domain zero, and we also have a couple of VMs that have been set up, but they're not started yet. So first I'm going to run uh, a web server as a unikernel, which is then uh, managed by Jitsu. So we're starting Jitsu, and we're going to use the domain jitsu.io, and DNS requests for that uh, domain name will, be, will return the IP address 192.168.25. And we also tell Jitsu to destroy the domain after uh, uh, there 
when there hasn't been activity for a certain timeout period, it will be destroyed, and we will forward unknown DNS requests to 8888, which is uh, Google's uh, name server. So now Jitsu is running. So now if we ping the domain jitsu.io, that should start a VM automatically. And here we can see that the VM booted and replies to the ping request. And we can also try to telnet to port 80, just to verify that the web server is actually running. So we kill the web server and telnet to the domain on port 80. And we can see that we're connected and we can download the index.html file, which is a hello mirage world uh, HTML file. But you may have noticed that there was an initial delay here uh, since we, uh, since there's a race when we boot Unikernel and we may lose the first sim of the TCP connection. So we can see again when we turn it to the, the web server, we can see that we're trying to connect and then we get uh, the connection is opened. And this is because there was a sim, sim retransmission which took one additional second. So that's why we need Sunjitsu as well. So, uh, and what Sunjitsu will do is that it's a unikernel that runs all the time and it will capture incoming SUNs, uh, store them in uh, SendStore so that they can be picked up by the unikernel when it has booted. So now Sunjitsu has been started and we also need to run, instead of the web server, we'll run the Sunjitsu app, which is defined here which basically does the same thing as the web server. It opens, uh, it listens to port 80, but it has been compiled with a TCP IP stack that uh, has Sinjitsu support enabled. So now the Sinjitsu app is running, and we can now tell that to uh, Jitsu IO again uh, on port 80, and this time we shouldn't have any uh, visible delay when we connect. Uh, and again, the Sinjitsu app will be booted, yep, and we're connected, and there was no delay. And what happened was that uh, when the initial sin came in, uh, the Sinjitsu app hadn't completed its boot process yet, but Sinjitsu captured the sin, uh, and when the unikernel was ready 50 to 100 milliseconds later, it picked up the sin uh, from sensor, uh, which was looked something like this. This is how the serialized format of the sin looks like and injected it into its TCP IP stack, and that triggered a SUNAC, which was sent uh, back to the client. So that's basically how it works. Thanks, Magnus. Uh, and so just to wrap up, um, ZenArm is here. It's, it's interesting that uh, uh, it's actually not very well known um, compared to obviously the x86 ARM, but there's a lot of commodity hardware and it's a really, really good way to run embedded uh, edge experiments. So to make it easier for other people to uh, take advantage of Zen, uh, we've actually got a bunch of uh, build scripts that are just uh, freely available that are a Linux and Zen distribution with everything pre-installed, uh, and you can just buy one of these QB boards and, uh, and get started. You can obviously do Linux-based experiments. You don't have to use unikernels, um, uh, but I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, and then uh, the other good thing is that all of the existing tools that we use in Zen um, are robust and just continue to work uh, with, uh, with this tool stack. And the other thing that uh, the research here has shown is just there's no fundamental drawback to virtual machines versus containers. It's just a matter of establishing the right discipline in order to uh, make sure that you can define your services carefully and, and architect the, uh, the data path of the latency and the, um, uh, and the actual network communications well and just avoid touching disk and, and doing all the usual um, optimizations that uh, people need to do. And uh, shipping out uh, type-safe code all the way to the, uh, the edge has been a dramatic success. Uh, we've, we've been building more and more complex deployments and uh, we're pretty happy with this whole idea of, of uh, starting from a clean slate library OS uh, in a high-level language. Uh, ongoing work, there's tons of work that I won't go into detail, but uh, we're working on uh, making Sinjitsu multi-protocol so we can terminate uh, TLS handshakes, so you can get even more benefit from the buffering, uh, and also working in wide area redirection so that um, you can detect when ARM boxes go down and redirect to a cloud service or some other um, hierarchy, uh, and also just working on uh, increasing the number of platforms, including uh, support for non-Zen-based hosts. So, uh, thank you very much for your time, and if you'd like to hear any more, you can go to the, the uh, website or come grab me afterwards. Thanks.
actually have a question yeah. for you. Um, so I noticed that uh, you have made an interesting choice of using OCaml, mm -hmm. um, which is quite unusual. I'm just trying to understand you know, the experience of using OCaml in terms of performance, in terms of usability, programmability on those issues. Um, so when we started uh, doing Mirage in about 2011, OCaml was uh, the only statically type-safe systems language we could use. So this is before uh, like Go and Rust um, even existed. So it's a really stable, natively compiled, single-threaded systems language. So it means that um, you can just uh, output uh, assembly or um, ARM, ARM or x86 code and just have something run very, very fast. So we've hit gigabit level speeds with uh, tool stacks just built entirely on OCaml, so TCP and SSL and so on. So uh, it's actually just been a very good success. It's also very stable. It's, uh, when we're building this much code, you just need something that uh, doesn't change all the time. But I'm sure in the future, uh, Rust in particular will become a viable alternative to, uh, to use as well. So. Thanks. Great. So let's thank the speakers and for the thank great you. panel as well. Thank you.